Shabbat shalom. Um, I, usually it'd be Layman would be teaching right now, or really probably Matt's turn about now, but uh, I think Layman's out of town. Um, so I'm teaching again this week. Um, I tell you, this week I, I had a message I was going to teach on, and I studied a whole bunch for it, and I just couldn't make it work. Uh, but I'll, I'll probably share some of that while we're going, and I feel like I kind of understand it. Um, but we'll go on jealousy today. And really, when I started studying this one, it started making the other one make sense. Um, I'll, I'll kind of tell you just where I was going to go. So when you look through Scripture, especially in this portion, you see this picture all the time. You see where the husband, um, here you see where Jacob, he loves Rachel more than he loves Leah. And then you see that same picture throughout Scripture. You'll see that... Um, with Jacob and Esau, that one's loved more than the other, and you see this with um, how God loved uh, Cain, and, or loved Abel more than Cain, and you see this picture all throughout Scripture, and it's like, why would God get this picture over and over again? Um, so I started looking here in this, this week, and I was like, okay, uh, there's another thing that this one kind of attaches to. You look at Joseph, when he's interpreting the dream, it's seven years for the fat cattle, and then seven years for the skinny cattle. And then here you see where Jacob is serving seven years for the uh, not-so-pretty one, and then he's serving seven years for the pretty one. And it's like, okay, what is, what is this, God? What, why did you do this multiple times in Scripture? What is something that you're trying to show us with this? Um, so I started looking and looking more and more, and um, you know, some of it I could see the Messiah inside. At first he comes you know, unsightly at first, and the second time he comes and he's, a beautiful uh, the second time they come so I could see that but then there's some things that didn't really work out because when Rachel she had an idol so that doesn't really work out so the Messiah the second time he's not gonna come and have an idol so it made me kind of throw things off some so then I just was you know searching then I came I was like okay we're gonna teach on jealousy uh, <laughs> uh, but well, when I was teaching on jealousy, it started making sense of what the other part was. And um, so hopefully I'll share a little bit of both. Um, and hopefully the message in the end will speak to each of you um, in some way. So um, we're going to start in Genesis 30, 1 through 21. Um, it says, Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she became jealous of her sister. And she said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Um, then Jacob angered, burned against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So one thing I started seeing, um, and you'll see later on, that um, this is the same thing that happens between um, Israel and Judah. Or really, it'd be Judah and Ephraim. So if you understand who Ephraim was, um, and you look at the, the sisters who they had. So Rachel, she had two children. She had... Um, but the main one that you need to know is Joseph. So Joseph is who had Ephraim and Manasseh, and is who God often refers to as when the children of Israel were spread out and they moved into all the nations, God often, often refers to them as Ephraim or the Gentiles. So Ephraim and Manasseh, they were actually part Gentile, right? Because you had Joseph who married a Gentile wife. So you see where God is referring to um, the nation of Israel that was spread out into the nations as Ephraim. So whenever you look at this, you see that Rachel, who is like this picture of Ephraim, um, became jealous with her sister Leah. So Leah, she had many children, um, and two of the main children she had was Judah and Levi, who we understand that's who that's the line of Jesus or Yeshua, and Levi being the priestly line. Um, so when I was looking at this, you know, some things started popping out whenever they were jealous of each other and um, how they had children at different times. And um, so I won't focus too much on that first, but I just want you, as we go through this, we'll come back and reference this passage 
as we go through other passages. So as, uh, she said, Here I am, I made Billa, go unto her that she may bear on my knee that through her I too may have children. So she was so jealous of her sister that she said, Hey, look, I just don't want you to have children with my sister. I'd rather you have it with my maid. And I'm going to claim it as my child. Um, but that happens to many of us. We'll get so jealous of our brother. We're like, I don't care if I, if I produce fruit for God. I just want fruit to be produced and it be attributed to me. Um, so we, you get this picture here. So she gave her maid Billah as a wife, and Jacob went into her. Uh, Billah conceived and bore Jacob a son. So Rachel said, God has vindicated me and has indeed heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore, she named him Dan. Rachel's maid Billah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. So Rachel said, with mighty wrestling, I have wrestled with my sister, have indeed prevailed, and she named him Naphtali. So again, so she is so happy that she's gotten fruit produced inside her life, but it's not even hers, it's her sister's. Um, that's some good jealousy right there, isn't it, huh? Like, if you don't even care if it's coming from you, you just want it to be done in your name. Um, we often do that ourselves. We don't even care what the fruit is produced. We're just like, oh, I just want it to be like that. Everyone sees that I'm producing fruit. Um, when Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took her maid Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, how fortunate. So she named him Gad. Leah's maid Zilpah, Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, happy am I, for women will call me happy. So she named him Asher. So she is so happy that her maid has bore a son that she's going to call the son's name Asher. Think about how jealous I have to be to do that. Like, I have to be so jealous that I'm like, I don't even want you to have kids. I'm going to give someone else to be your husband and him to produce fruit with that. And that is what my jealousy is bringing about. It's fruit that's not even mine. I'm going to claim it as mine. Now in the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. So I looked up, I was trying to look at mandrakes to see if it had some kind of special meaning to it. And maybe it does when you look at the Hebrew. Uh, but it was really saying it was like a aphrodisiac. Um, she was like, give me some of your man, son's mandrakes. So she said to her, it is a small matter for you to take my husband. And would you take my son's mandrakes also? So Rachel said, therefore, he may lie with you tonight in return for your son mandrakes. So Leah's like, you're trying to take my son mandrakes? And you're trying to take my husband? She said, like, look, you go ahead. You can lie with her tonight, Leah, and then I'll take your mandrakes from you. When Jacob came in from the field in the evening, then Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. God gave heed to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. So you had what Leah bore many, bore many children. Rachel gets jealous. She gives her maid. Then Leah gets jealous. She gives her maid. And then Leah comes back and have children again. And then after that, Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my maid to my husband. So he named him Issachar. Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son to Jacob. So this is Leah. She's born another son after that. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a great, a good gift. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and named her Dina. So this is the end of uh, Leah bearing children. And then, you know, Rachel will bear two children after that. So we'll go to uh, Genesis 37. So this, so you have this picture of Leah and Jacob, Leah and Rachel being jealous of each other. And we, I'm trying to give you a picture of that before. So it's a kind of picture of Israel and Judah being jealous of each other. And we'll see that that's used inside the New Testament. So then here you got this other picture of Jacob. Um, and he is, again, getting favor from his father. And it brings about jealousy from his brothers. Um, and we'll read that passage. It says, these are the records of the generation of jo Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. While he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bila and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. So I think that is very pertinent to understand that he loved them. And one of the reasons he loved them is because they came later on in his life. 
um, which you also see that that happens with Ephraim. And Ephraim is something that comes on later on in their life that comes to become great nation was when Ephraim came on later inside the understanding of uh, Yeshua. Um, and he made him a very coat uh, tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream, which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep rose up and also stood erect. Behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheep. Then his brother said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are they really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dream and for his words. Now he had still another dream, and related to his brother and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related to his father and to his brothers, and his brothers rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So one thing here, we understand with the story of Joseph, who is that a picture of? Jesus, Yeshua, right? So all his brothers are going to come, and they're all going to bow down to the, him. And him telling them this, that he is the Messiah, will cause them to hate him, right? It will cause them to be jealous of him. So we understand that in the New Testament. Um, so it, this can be applied to our life, too, with jealousy. When we see the promise of God working in someone else, and we can say, oh, man, I don't, really don't like that person because I see God work inside their life. And we won't admit to that. We would just we see it and we're like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't like that. Um, so we're going to Numbers 11. And I'm just going to show you a few different examples of jealousy, and then we'll talk about jealousy. Uh, Numbers 11, 16 through 30 says, The Lord therefore said to Moses, Gather from me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and their officers, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. Then I will come down, I'll speak to you there, and I will take of the spirit who is upon you, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you will not bear it alone. Say to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat for you, and have wept, for you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat, for we were well off in the Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You know, anytime it talks about Egypt, I always think about my sinful nature. I always think about, you know, we are saved from our sin. Yeshua died so that we are saved from our sin. Just like Israel was saved from their sin by the sheep that was slaughtered and the blood was put on their doorpost. So that same picture there. So here, I always think back whenever I see that in Scripture. Oh, they're complaining. I wish we could go back to, our, to Egypt. I wish I could go back to whenever I was a slave. That I, I had so much more whenever I was sinful. So that's the same thing we do now, right? We always claim back, man, I wish I'd go back to where I was sinful and I stole from people and I took and I was dishonest. I had meat back then. And then God's like, look, I'm, what, what is meat for us now, right? What's meat for us now? Remember, you can be fed with meat or with milk. So his word, right? So his word, you can be milk or it can be meat. So here he says, I'm going to give you so much meat that you're going to be tired of eating meat. Uh, I'll give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall not. Eat, you shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and have wept before Him, saying, "Why did we ever leave Egypt?" But Moses said, "The people whom I am are six hundred thousand foot. You have said, I will give them meat, so that they may eat for a whole month." Should flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to be sufficient for them? Or should all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to be sufficient for them? The Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord's. I, is the Lord powerful, power limited? Now you shall see whether my word will come true or, for you or not. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. Also gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and stationed them around the tents. Then the Lord came down in the clouds and spoke to him. And he took the spirit who was upon him and placed it upon the 70 elders. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do it again. Do it, it again. So it's completely off subject while I was talking about, about the meat. That's completely off subject. 
But I do see that nowadays. I see people where they have so much of the word, so much of the meat of the word, that they get sick of it. And it's like they've been studying it, and they become just like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm kind of tired of studying. I don't really have to go read the word anymore. And I see that where people get complacent with the word because they have, they've gotten so much knowledge that they become complacent. But then before, they're complaining like, ah, oh, why won't you give us more, God? Won't you give me more? And then God gives them so much. They're like, ah, oh, okay, I'm... I'm tired of reading that now, but that's off subject. So here you have the 70 elders, and when the Spirit rests upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do it again. It says, but two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eliad, and the name of the other was Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those who had been registered, but had not gone out of the tent, and they prophesied in the camp. So the young men ran and told Moses and said, Eliad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses from his youth, said, Moses, my Lord, restrained them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all of the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? Then Moses returned to the camp, both he and the elders of Israel. So I'm just trying to make this point that many times people get jealous when the Spirit of God comes upon people, and they say, Oh, what are they? this doesn't look right. How are these people prophesying? How are these people teaching the word of God? And you see that all the time. And then you see it, the people go and say, oh, yeah, that's not, that's not God. God's not doing that. Um, or they get jealous of their brother. And just like uh, Rachel and Leah were jealous of each other, they were in the presence of Abraham. They were close to Abraham, and Abraham was producing inside them. You're going to see that same thing within the body. So you should expect it. Um, Rome, this is Numbers 25, 6 through 13. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a midnight woman in the sight of Moses, in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel, <clears throat> while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the, the priest saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the, <clears throat> the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through <clears throat> the men of Israel and the woman through the body. So the plagues on the sons of Israel were checked. Those who died with the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel with my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I give my covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. So if you look, say, is it wrong to be jealous if you're jealous for God? If you're jealous for the things of God, is it wrong for that? Well, no, he just, God just not rewarded him because he was so jealous to have the presence of God among the people that whenever he went and addressed the issue, not that he went and go spoke about the issue to everybody else, he went and addressed the issue. He went straight to the source and addressed it. Then God says, because he was righteous in his jealousy, because he wanted that the Spirit of God would be among his people so bad, then he rewarded him. He said, well, you will be a priest of my nations. Right? So it's not necessarily wrong to be jealous if it's for the jealousy for the right thing. So go to Deuteronomy 4, 24. It says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, jealous God. I was talking to a, a guy I know, one of our my relatives, and when he read about God being jealous, he's saying, well, how can you worship a God who is jealous? How can you go and then, how can you say, well, this is someone that's worthy to be followed? He said, that's, jealousy is not good. I said, no, no, no. I said, if you cheated on your wife, would you want her to be jealous? If you were over there with another woman, would you want her to be jealous? Yes, you would want her to be jealous. You would desire for her to, to want you more enough to bring him back. So jealousy in itself is not necessarily wrong. But jealousy for the wrong reasons is wrong. So if you're not jealous for the presence of God, if you're not jealous for what is righteous, then that is wrong. If you're jealous for the things of this world, then that is wrong. Because God is a jealous God. He desires your presence. You are the bride of Christ, and he desires your presence. So like, and whenever we are evil and we are separated from the presence of God, it says he is a jealous God and a consuming fire. And that is righteousness. But in Proverbs 6, 34 says, For jealousy enrages a man, and he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Um, so there is another kind of jealousy. 
we read also in Proverbs 27, 4, it says, Wrath is fierce and anger is a flood, but who can stand before jealousy? So someone who has wrath is fierce. That seems, that's pretty scary, right? It said, uh, and anger is a flood. So if you're very angry, it comes as a flood to wipe things out. It said, but who can stand before jealousy? Who can stand before a man who is jealous for his wife? So that's even a greater um, form of emotion than anger and wrath. <clears throat> so the same thing for God. When God has jealousy for his people, you cannot stand before him. So we're going to go to Isaiah 11, 11 through 14. So then it will happen on the day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand, the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Patras, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath. So what are, what are these type nations? Gentile nations, right? It says that God's going to recover the remnant of his people from these nations and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard from the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel. So what's the standard that he lifts up? The plumb line? Yeshua, right? And he will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So then who else is he gathering? Judah. It says, Then the jealousy of Ephraim will depart, and those who harass Judah will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah anymore, and Judah will not harass Ephraim. So that's the same thing that's talking about before. You can see the same prophecy that will happen with Rachel and Leah. That when they have their children, they're gathered back together and to be one. You won't see the jealousy of Ephraim and Judah anymore. They will swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines on the west. Together, they will plunder the sons of the east. They will possess Edom and Moab, and the sons of Ammon will be subject to them. So that was the other thing when I was looking at those seven years for the fat cows and seven years for the skinny cows. Saying, well, how does that relate? Now, I remember at the end, what happened with the skinny cows? What did they do? They eat the fat cows, so then become one. So the same thing happens with Ephraim and Judah. In the end, when you see with the promise in Jeremiah that says that I will, begin, I will again make a covenant with, with Israel and Judah, my covenant with Israel, so there will be one again. So that's part of the covenant that God makes, that one, they'll be combined together. But what will happen, though, before, they're going to be jealous of each other. You're going to see that Israel and Judah will be jealous of each other. And even what we'll see later in some other verses, that that is what brings them back to serving God. It's the jealousy for each other that what bring them back to serving God. So Acts 13, 42 through 52, it says, As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue is broken up, many of the Jews of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, they were the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming, saying, hey, this isn't of God. That's not the spirit of God. But Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you have repudiated it, and, ju and judge yourself worthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. So what was, who was it important for him to be with first? Leah. He says, It is important for, me, for Leah to be married to you because it is our custom that, Leah is that the older is married to the young, uh, married first. It says, so, for so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light before the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, began rejoicing and glorifying the words of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. So what happened when that, that fruit started being produced? They rejoiced. Remember, just like the wives that said, oh, we are rejoicing. I named my kid uh, Asher. And the word of the Lord has been spread throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and leading the men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So we'll go to Romans. 
So we do Romans 10, we go through Romans 11. So how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. That's us. However, they did not all heed the good news from Isaiah. It says, Lord, says, Lord who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, Messiah. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voices have gone out into the earth and their words to the ends of the, ends of the earth. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. So we see this picture all through scripture of someone being jealous because he predicted it. That, and that's supposed to bring you to follow him. And Isaiah said, it is very bold. And say, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest by those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all the days long I have stretched out my hand to be a disobedient and obstinate people. I say, then God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what Scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? It says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Even now, I think of this. Like everything that has happened in Yeshua's time, everything that you see that happens before, it's going to happen again. Like God says he's going to show the end from the beginning, right? So anytime you're looking at the beginning, you should be able to see the end. So whenever you see that there is a remnant here, and it looks like, man, where is everybody at who's going to go do the work of God? Many times I pray to God and I say, God, please will you send your workers out into the field that will go out to the poor and the lost and the needy. And let us quit being stuck inside our own places. I pray that quite often that God will send more workers. But he says, look, there has always come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? What Israel is seeking it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. That's why I, mean, I hate it when I hear people say, oh, they rejected the Messiah. Then they talk evil of the Jews now. Say, oh, they rejected the Messiah. So he says in his word that he gave them a spirit of stupor and eyes to not see and ears to not hear. Like, we should be so merciful. <laughs> And David says, let their table become, become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. I say to them, then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. So what is supposed to happen? Salvation comes to the Gentiles to make them jealous, make the Jews jealous, to bring them back. Now, if their transgression is rich is for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But as I am speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am to an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them, for if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So I'm saying, like, if I can go live this righteous life, and it makes them jealous, and I save just a few of them from that jealousy, then praise to God. If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and become partakers with them of the richest root of the olive tree, do, you, do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Uh, we have nothing to boast. Even to hold over brothers and sisters, you say, oh, they're over there. They don't understand this about God yet. 
we have nothing to boast. It's only that the root has given you life. You can be cut off just as easily. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fail. Severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you are cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this ministry, so that you will not be wise in your own understanding that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of your fathers. So that's the one thing you have to understand. Many times it seems like people are enemies against you. Like they're speaking like, oh, these people are crazy. These people are doing right. And it seems like they're your enemies. But you have to remember this saying over and over again. For the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. So even if someone might come against you and speak evil of you, I have to remember that because I have many people who might have lied to about me in the past or lied about people I know in the past. Remember, from God's point of view, he wants them to be saved. From God's point of view, he wants them to be part of the kingdom. And if you live a life that's holy and, un and acceptable to him, he'll bring them the jealousy. They'll see your holiness. They'll see you living for God and it'll turn their hearts to God just like it's going to turn the Jews back to God. So don't look at them and say, ah, they are my enemy. So no, no, no. From God's point of view, they are my brother. From God's point of view, if I live how I'm supposed to live, then they will become jealous. And if they see God working in my life, they see his spirit upon me, they'll become jealous. And they'll say, well, I want to follow God. I see God working in them. I see him producing fruit. I see them producing children inside their life. So then, ah, oh, that makes me want to go serve God all the more. For the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also, be, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depth and the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Amen. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counsel? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So then we have to look at this, okay? We can't leave this part of jealousy out. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9. It says, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, not meat. For you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able yet. Able. For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, and you are not, or you not fleshly, and or you not walking like mere men. So since you still are jealous of each other, are you not still children? Are you still not little babies? I can't give you meat. If you're still jealous of what God is doing in other people's lives, are you not still little babies? Like, so we should get past that point our, ourselves. Once you get to a point with God, you should get past that point of jealousy. You should get past that point inside your life that that must inspire you. And that should not be something that separates you from your brother. You shouldn't. So I can have, I'll tell you, there are many times I've seen God working inside my brother when I have fallen back. And I said, oh, man, I need to go back and get on my knees again. I need to make sure I'm praying again. I need to make sure that I'm living for him again. And I'm inspired by jealousy of righteousness to go back to it 
But in the same sense, I can't allow that jealousy to cause strife between me. I can't let it cause anger between me where it separates me from my brother. Because many times we have jealousy and that's what happens. We say, oh, I see God working them. I see him producing fruit. So I want to push you away. And I want to talk evil of you. Oh, man, that person, that's, that's not really God working in their life. Like we want to push them away. But what it should do is we should inspire us to want to make fruit ourselves, to make children ourselves. That's what it should inspire us to do. For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul, servants to whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one? I planted Apollos' water, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants or the one who waters anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. That's why I'm, you know, I'm not real big on denominations and claiming a denomination, because we are Israel. We are the children of God, and I don't follow any man except Yeshua. And I try to make that be a point, because I don't want anything to separate me from a brother. I don't want me to say, like, well, I'm this or I'm that, and I'm going to stand on this, because... I'm Yeshua's, and if he guides me away from something that we put in writing, then and I'm going to follow him instead of follow that writing that we write down about my belief. Does that make sense? <clears throat> but that's the thing. If we are drawn to jealousy, many times what draws us to jealousy inside this church, inside the world nowadays, you see these churches who are trying to compete on how big a church they can get. And then others say, oh, well, I want to build a bigger church than them. We're the biggest inside the town. And that is foolishness in the face of God. So James 3, we'll end there. It says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brother, knowing that as such will incur stricter judgment. And I'll tell you that over and over again. If you become a teacher, you can just write that down and put it on your mirror and uh, expect that to happen to you. For we all stumble in many ways, but if, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put their bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds or are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. So how great a farce to set a fire by such a small fire. So I just want you to realize the very first part of this chapter, it talks about, hey, don't all of you want to be teachers? And then it comes right after that and starts talking about being able to control your tongue. Why do you think it has those two together? Because there's a lot of people who want to be teachers, so then they start talking a whole bunch about people who are teachers and saying, look, there's a stricter judgment that comes with it. And the tongue is a fire, the very word of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that will, which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and sets on fire by hell. So it's just saying that I can use my tongue and I can come and, and set a fire the whole body and get you all hating each other. Which that's what we see happens, right? We see churches split all the time. And what happens? We got this tongue that goes around and starts talking to people and sets the whole body on fire. It says, for every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human's race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless, evil, and full of deadly poison. Which it will bless our Lord and Father, and with it will curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes those blessing and curses. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does the fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree be, my brethren, produce olive, or a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce fresh? Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. Like, don't tell yourself a lie that I'm really serving God when it's really jealousy inside your heart that's causing you to speak bad about your brother. I don't be saying like, oh, I'm, I'm, this is for God. I'm, I'm serving God by speaking bad about somebody. No, that's jealousy inside your heart. 
This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but it's earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. And I think we've got to uh, witness this before, and I've seen many churches witness this. Again, you have selfish ambition that comes in, and it causes disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy, and the seed, is whose, uh, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So, so I always look at that when I listen to people. Is their heart to make peace or is their heart to make war? Is their heart to separate brothers, separate the body, or is their heart to bring the body together? So, and that's how you usually can tell if it's jealousy is doing it or if it's righteousness is doing it. If their heart is to break bodies apart, you say that's jealousy. If their heart is to bring the body together to make them one, then that is righteousness. Did I read that last part? I don't know if I did. But the wisdom... Uh, uh, okay. Yep. James 3 in the SB 95. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So if you are jealous, let it be for the presence of God. So if you are going to be jealous at all, let it be to have the presence of God. Let it be to say, look, we are going to get rid of this evil inside our midst so that we can have the presence of God in our midst. Like Phineas. Phineas, that is his desire. He says, look, I cannot have it be that the presence of God is not among us. So I'm going to destroy this evil here so that I have the presence of God among me. <clears throat> if we have jealousy, it should be to produce fruit for the kingdom. That's what their jealousy was. That's what Rachel and Leah's jealousy was, that they wanted to produce fruit for Abraham. Just like I must have the jealousy to want to produce fruit for the father. But that should not cause me to separate from brothers or separate from the body. So our fruit should bring about the jealousy in our brothers. Like if we are living a life of God and we, they see our spirit inside of us, we should inspire others to want that. We should inspire others to have a desire for that. So like when you are living a life for him and like you are going and doing the things that God calls you to do and God is seeing him answer your prayers and God is seeing him work inside your life, it should inspire, they should desire that, they should envy that and want that. So like that's for me, like, man, I've seen that happen to me many times where I, I, I see, see God work in someone's life. And like all of us have downfalls. You know, like when I, we were praying this morning, like he prayed with such confidence. And many times I do that, I'll pray with such confidence. And But that inspires you as brothers to be closer to God, right? And that's what we were saying. He was talking about how he desires um, brothers to pray with. And like I do too. Like I want you guys to pray with. I want people to pray with. Because like we will inspire each other to go and then serve him closer, to be closer to God. And we will inspire each other to be closer to the Father and do, do more for the Father. And I just um, hope that, that you will be inspired to jealousy too. So we should not be jealous that God is using someone and not us. We should not be saying, oh, I can't believe he's using them and not us. Like change yourself. You go search to be, the father, be close to him. He will use any of you. If you'll go and you'll give your heart to him, you'll spend time in prayer, you'll spend time helping the least of these, God will use you. Don't be jealous of that brother that God is using to him. Say, no, I myself, I'm going to go live for him. I myself, I'm going to go spend time in prayer. I'm going to do the hard things. I'm going to give up my time. I'm going to quit watching these things that are worthless. I'm going to quit doing these things that are worthless. I'm going to spend time with him. We should not let our godly jealousy separate us. We should not let, because we see God working in someone else's life, that we say, oh, man, I'm going to let that separate me. Oh, I see a lot of people are going to his Bible study I don't like him anymore. People do that. People do that. They'll say, oh, I, I, I see a, guy, a lot of people are going over there to listen to him speak. And then they'll be jealous of that person and let him separate them. That should not be how we should act. We should be praising God that God is teaching people. We should be praising God that people are turning to him. If y'all would, join me in prayer. Father, we come before you, a gracious God, a wonderful God, who shows mercy to to us, the least of these, these creations that you have made us. 
Father, we just ask you to forgive us for any sin that we have done against our brother. We have spoken evil of our brother when we have been jealous and we have separated ourselves from our brother. Father, we ask that you will convict our hearts of sin that we do not see, things that we do not know that we are doing. Father, we just ask that we would allow each person here to be able to build each other up, that we would listen to our brothers whenever they come to speak to us to draw us closer to you. Father, we just ask that you would put humble hearts into each of us so that we can be a willing vessel to be used for your kingdom. Father, we come before you and we worship you and magnify your name. We just ask that you would use each of us this week for your kingdom, for your good, for your glory, and that many people will be led to you. We love you and we trust you. In your son Yeshua's holy name, amen.